you to everyone for being with us today. I can think of no more urgent and pressing subject for this year's Aspen Security Forum than the question of Ukraine. And I think it's um, really great and important that we get to have a, a sort of a report from the ground first uh, from Kiev. I believe we have Andrei Yermak already on the line on Zoom with us. Is that right? Hello? Yeah. Ah, oh, hello. Can you hear us? Hello. Hi. Yes. Yes. Thank, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I think everyone here uh, in Aspen at the Security Forum is eager really to hear your report from the ground. And I, I think we should just jump right in to that. Uh, there is an enormous investment uh, among almost everyone here in the question of how Ukraine is faring in its summer counteroffensive against Russia. There is a sense and a fear and a concern uh, that it's not going as quickly as we would have liked. Uh, and we would, we would really value, I think, you beginning today by giving us a report on where you think things stand weeks into this counteroffensive and what we should be looking for next. Thank you so much. Thank you, Susan. Dear friends, I'm honored uh, to be here and pleased to talk to you. First of all, I'd like to use this opportunity and uh, I want to thank uh, President Biden, his administration, Congress, both parties. We are grateful to American people. You are God, freedom, independence and democracy in your veins. And so do Ukraine. Ukraine will definitely win this war, and it will be our common victory with the United States. We are making every effort to bring closer and secure peace in the future. And in the win uh, withdraw Wilson, famous uh, 14 points, he stated, we cannot be separated in interest or divided in purpose. We stand together until the end. Just like a century ago, determination and unity have given us a unique opportunity to change the world. So let's do it. Now I'm uh, ready to answer to your questions. And as I understand the first questions, it's about the counteroffensive. And I'd like to say, first of all, it's war. And uh, uh, I'd like to say that uh, we in the, I think in historical and a very important cooperation with our partners, first of all, the United States. And uh, of course, we, uh, I can say that it's uh, counteroffensive. It's going not sample once again, because it's war. And it's very difficult uh, to be sure and to guarantee that it will be this, particularly by this speed. But in general, it's going by plan. And, uh, and of course, uh, we do all the, all the best. First of all, our heroes in front line, our military, all, all Ukrainian nations, because the main goal, the main our uh wishes of all ukrainians it's to win this war and of course it's uh, absolutely uh once again it's it's great that the cooperation with the our aliens today in the very high level and uh, it's it's very healthy well, thank you so much. I, I noticed a report today that the new cluster munitions that the United States just approved sending to Ukraine are already there and being used uh, on the ground in the fight. Uh, and I'm curious, what, what is most important for Ukraine in its fight that you do not have yet from the West or from the United States? First of all, uh, Susan, thank you very much that you are mentioned about cluster ammunition. Yes, it's a great and thank you very much for, for these decisions uh, uh, for President Biden once again, for Congress, for uh, all American people. It's really was uh, uh, very important. And uh, I can the my, my answer will be very simple. Uh, this uh, 
points, it's uh, very clear and understandable. We need and waiting for decisions of other accounts. Uh, we waiting uh, and we talking with our partners and we're happy that uh, they heard us. It's about we need more our defense. You can see what happened last days in Odessa and Nikolai. You know, I'm sure about what happened with the uh, grain corridors. And this is the problem not just about for you of Ukraine. It's a problem of the world, of the of the many countries. And of course, we need F-16s. Many people here, uh, F-16s. Uh, and of do course, you got... it's yeah. Yeah. We have here uh, someone who was until recently in the Pentagon, so I promise we'll ask him next uh, to give us a report on your, on your list there. But let me ask you, so many of us here, of course, paid very close attention to the recent, let's call it, attempted mutiny by uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin in Russia. What I want to know is what effect, if any, has this division inside Russia's elite meant in, on the ground in the fight? Do you perceive a weakening uh, in the Russian military as a result of this? Do you perceive uh, a weakening in Putin? Or has it not made any difference yet that you can tell? Uh, as you can see, the war unfortunately continue and uh, it's it's real war and you can see by these attacks and uh, by uh, missiles rockets and the drones uh, it's uh, it's continuing uh, what if you ask about the our attitude for the uh, uh, everything which happens in in the russia the last month i think that during this uh, more than 500 days First of all, Ukrainian nations, our soldiers, our army, it showed that the, the help of our partners showed that this is the not the reality that Russia is uh, have the second strongest army in the world or just stronger army. And the second, I think that these events show absolutely clear and understandable for all people in the world. In the list of the strong leaders uh, of, of the world, not more and not place uh, for President Putin. This is my answer. So last week, of course, there was the um, NATO summit in Vilnius. And I guess at the end, there was a lot of back and forth, uh, including a, uh, a very controversial tweet from your boss, President Zelensky. He called the language in the NATO statement absurd. I'm curious, at the end of the summit, how, how did you come out understanding what is it that Ukraine needs to do in order to get the invitation? First of all, I'd like to classify, clarify that the tweet uh, of President Zelensky was about his uh, uh, estimate and for what goal he going to this summit. And uh, I'd like to not uh, and ask, to not found uh, another and more sense of this tweet. The second, it's necessary to look to the exact results of the Vilnius summit. And as I said, President Zelensky's summit was successful, but of course, always it's possible to make it more successful. But uh, most important that uh, we back to Ukraine and we exactly understand what uh, our next steps. First of all, we have to win this war and as soon as possible. And of course, we continue our cooperations and our coordination with our partners and you listen and we listen in this summit that uh, all aliens not just believe they sure that Ukraine uh, Ukraine will win second Ukraine Ukraine needs to uh, get and draw security guarantees and I'd like to use this opportunity to say thank you very much because we have long and uh, hard work uh, in the results of this work was announced declarations 
And uh, of course, it's a great work of my co-chairs of the International Group of Experts, uh, Mr. Rasmussen. I'd like to say thank you very much, my colleagues, uh, advisor of national security of the Alliance of G7, first of all, Jake Sullivan, Emmanuel Bonn, uh, Jens Plotner, and many others, uh, Tim Barlow, the colleagues from Japan, the colleagues from Italy, the colleagues from Canada and other countries. And uh, the third, uh, we need to continue working of the implementation of the peaceful formula of President Zelensky. And now I'm very involved of the preparation of the very soon uh, second meeting of in the level of advisors uh, in which we continue the consultations for the goal to organize peaceful summit. I'd like to say that, uh, and this is confirmed by all colleagues, not just from the country of G7, and it's uh, also from the uh, country from Global South, its platform which united the world because 10 points of the peaceful formula, it's not just about how to end the, the war in Ukraine. It's about the uh, big uh, crisis which uh, uh, arised and appeared as a result of this war. I mean about the crisis, uh, it's about food security, it's about nuclear security, it's about ecology, and of course, it's uh, about the very important humanitarian things, because for Ukraine, we need to back not just our territories, we need to back all our people, especially, and, may, and one of the may, very painful for us, we need to back, uh, to back all our Ukrainians' children uh, who was illegally deported uh, to the Russia Federation and uh, um, occupied territories. And now we are working. I'd like to say that we already, the at least of the country which we involved, very impressed. It's uh, three, four times more than we uh, have in the meeting in Copenhagen. And we continue this work. Once again, thank you very much for all colleagues in uh, all the world, because it's really very important. Andre Yermak, we want to thank you very much uh, for being with us, joining us today from Kyiv, and we look forward to hosting you here in person uh, next year once the war is over. So thank you very much, Andre Yermak. Thank you very much, and I'm sorry that I can't be today with you physically, but I hope very soon after our victory we can meet. Thank you very much. Slava Ukraini. Thank you again. And now we're going to jump right in to the panel because I think we've been given a lot to discuss. As I mentioned, we have with us today Colin Call, who until I think about two weeks ago was the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy, which means he was in charge of that long list of um, uh, wish list, if you will, of what uh, Ukraine needs and wants in order to fight its war. So Colin, why don't we just go ahead and start with that as, as the conversation. Uh, uh, many of us here have gotten used to what seems like a bit of a pattern uh, that has sort of unfolded, probably not necessarily uh, by design, uh, that we've gone from one round of debates over weapon systems to another, most recently the cluster munitions. Uh, Andre Yermak mentioned the attackums. Uh, and so I guess I'll ask you, now that you're on the outside, you can be very frank with us. Uh, <laughs> are we looking at another uh, no, 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 yes situation for that? Uh, well, thanks. Uh, it's great to be uh, with you all. Um, look, I, we just announced another package yesterday. I've, I've been off the clock for six days, so I, <laughs> I, my filter is gradually uh, coming down. Ruthless uh, candor, yeah. ruthless candor here. Uh, no, the administration announced another package yesterday, $1.3 billion. I think that brings the total of security assistance uh, since the war began 17 months ago uh, to $43 billion. Um, that's never happened in the history of the world. It defies bureaucratic uh, uh, physics that it was possible. And I know that there's this critique out there that, that it has been an incremental uh, approach and too incremental. 
but the reality is, as generous as Congress has been and as generous as the American people has been, uh, we didn't have $43 billion on day one of the war. Uh, we've had tranches of money, and so at each phase, we've had to decide what Ukraine needs most right now, which means what can get to them, what are they trained on, what's sustainable, what's relevant for the period of the fight. So, for example, in the first six weeks of the war, which will go down in history as the most impactful uh, period because it was the period in which the Russians were defeated in the battle for Kyiv and therefore uh, Putin's objectives in Ukraine were thwarted, we had about $3 billion to spend. And we could have spent it on Patriot missiles and F-16s and Abrams tanks. None of that stuff would have arrived uh, uh, for months. Uh, the Ukrainians weren't trained on any of it. So instead, we focused on javelins and stingers and ammunition for Soviet legacy equipment. And that enabled the Ukrainians, with their extraordinary courage and resilience, to defeat the Russians. Uh, and so if you went back in a time machine and said, should I have spent that $3 billion on other stuff? Of course not. Uh, so we've been incremental, and as we moved into the next phase of the war, we shifted towards artillery, uh, high Mars, then Patriot systems and air defense systems, because that's what they needed, and then we helped build this mountain of steel uh, for the counteroffensive, which is ongoing. So at each point, we've delivered what uh, is at the top of the Ukrainian uh, priority list. My team put together all of those packages, every single one. Uh, I'm, I'm extraordinarily proud uh, for what they did. I'm also particularly grateful to Secretary Warmuth, who's sitting out there, because the Army gave more of its stuff than anybody else. And one of the things that obviously you heard from Andre was uh, the continued desire for the attackums. These are the long-range missiles that fire off the back of the HIMARS systems. I'll just say one of the considerations we've had to have as we've put together these security assistance packages is not just what Ukraine has, but to the degree that we draw them down from our stockpiles, what needs do we have around the world? We don't make attackums anymore. They're a very precious commodity, and they are required, they would be required for any contingency we have anywhere in the world, Iran, North Korea, China, you name it. And so if they were provided in substantial quantities, that would come at real, with real implications for our readiness. Now, the good news is, the Ukrainians already have deep fires capabilities. They've got the Storm Shadow cruise missile that the UK has provided. The French are providing the Scout missile. The problem with the counteroffensive right now is not their ability to strike deep. They have that ability. They are doing it now. The Russian command and control, their logistics have been disrupted in the deep. The problem is not 100 kilometers away. It's one kilometer in front of them with the minefield. So we'll continue to help uh, uh, them with that. Uh, and we'll continue to provide uh, the security assistance that they need. Colin, I know we want to bring in the other panelists, but just uh, Andre did not really answer on the counteroffensive. So I'll ask you, is it, is it a fair characterization that this uh, progress so far has been slower than we expected, than U.S. models showed? And, and what is the reason for that? You know, there's the old adage, you know, uh, no plan survives first contact with reality. Uh, this was uh, obviously something that we talked a lot with the Ukrainians about. They, I think, you know, there's not one counteroffensive. There are actually several counteroffensives. There's a major push in the east. There's also a number of points where there's a push in the south. I think the Ukrainians are being very deliberate because, you know, we, we had six months to build the Ukrainians this mountain of steel. Tanks, armored vehicles, Bradley fighting vehicles, mine clearing equipment, engineering equipment, uh, a lot of artillery. But the Russians also had six months to dig in. Uh, and those uh, defensive belts, uh, particularly in the south, are particularly nasty. And so they are going slowly, but that's because they're going deliberately. And I will just say this, the counteroffensive is not over. The majority of Ukrainian combat power has not been devoted to the counteroffensive. Most people don't realize that. And I'm confident that when and if the Ukrainians find a soft spot in Russian defenses, they will have an opportunity to breach and make progress. Uh, so let's see. Uh, uh, we're still, I think, toward the beginning, not at the end of the counteroffensive. Yeah. So Alexandra Matvichuk, you are a Nobel Prize winner, uh, as, uh, as Anya mentioned, and uh, head of the Center for Civil Liberties. I noticed that just a few days ago, you know, you were sharing on social media uh, what it's like to be under attack and spending the night in the corridor in, in Kyiv. Uh, and just today, of course, it's your friends in Odessa who are under attack. You have expressed the view publicly that Ukraine is not and will not be safe until uh, Russia cannot strike at Ukraine from Crimea. So, you know, tell us a little bit about what you think is, is possible right now. What if it is not possible militarily for Ukraine to take back Crimea? What does that mean to you and your friends in, in Kyiv? I'm a human rights lawyer, 
and I have been applying the law to defend people and human dignity for many years. And at present, I found myself in a situation when the law doesn't work. Because Russian troops deliberately shell in residential buildings, schools, churches, hospitals, attack evacuation corridors, manage filtration camps system, organize forcible deportations, commit murders, tortures, rapes, abductions, and other kinds of offenses against civilians. And the entire international architecture of international treaties and international organizations can't stop such Russian atrocities. So our panel is titled, What Next for Ukraine? But I think the better name of our panel is, What's Next for Ukraine? What's Next for the World? Because it's not just a war between two states. This is a war between two systems, authoritarianism and democracy. Putin started this war not in February 2022, but started this war in February 2014, when Ukraine obtained a chance for the quick democratic transition after the revolution of dignity. And in order to stop us on this way, Putin occupied Crimea, part of Lugansk and Donetsk region, and last year extended this war to the large-scale invasion. And this is a clear sign that Putin, as like any dictator, is afraid of the idea of freedom. And with this war, Putin attempts not just to punish Ukrainians for our democratic choice, which we made nine years ago, when millions of Ukrainians stood up their ways against corrupt and authoritarian our previous government. Just for a chance to build a country where the rights of everybody are protected, government is accountable, judiciary is independent, and police do not beat students who are peacefully demonstrating. And we paid a high price for this chance. But Putin attempts to convince the whole world that democracy, rule of law, and human rights are fake values because they couldn't protect you during the war. And this is not just a task for Ukraine to respond to this value dimension of this war. It's a joint responsibility of entire international community. Because look what is going on. We are in a situation when the member of Security Council of UN can start the war of aggression, commit horrible, horrible atrocities, just to break people's resistance and occupy the country. And nobody can stop it. So may I ask you, as a human rights defender, how we, people who live in the 21st century, will protect a human beings, their lives, their freedoms, their dignity? Can we rely on the law or just nuclear weapons matter? Phil Zelico, I'm not going to ask you to bear the whole burden of answering Alexandra's very important question. Uh, but I do think that she has, has raised some of the, the big picture issues that are, that are faced here, and, and Andre did as well, which is what, is it, what does it mean to offer a security guarantee to Ukraine at this moment in time? President Biden often speaks of uh, the U.S. being willing and committed to fight as long as it takes. Uh, but of course, there is a political reality of an election here in the U.S., as well as elections that will take place in European partners uh, over the next year. Uh, do you think that we are in a position to offer uh, a security guarantee or to in any way really respond to the profound question that, that Alexandra has asked us? I think the way to think about this is life is answering this question now. Uh, are we or are we not actually guaranteeing Ukraine's security in life, in results? And that's the real measure, not what performative gestures uh, we utter at a meeting in some foreign capital. And what I'd really like to emphasize, because Colin has already addressed the traditional military stuff in the battlefield that everyone is following, I'd actually like to call your attention to the other battlefield, the other part of the war. This is a war of staying power. Russia knows it, and a lot of Ukrainians know it. And there's bad news and there's good news. 
the bad news, and friends of Ukraine need to be clear about this and talk straight to each other about it. The bad news is Ukrainians are moving towards what will be a, could be a winter of discontent, to borrow a phrase Bob Zellick used recently. Last year, Ukraine lost 29% of its GDP. More than a third of the population of Ukraine is displaced, and a large fraction of that has had to leave the country and is wondering whether or when they will ever come home. This is a country, the largest country that's wholly inside Europe. It has no civil aviation. Its transportation system has now gone back to the 1950s. It's losing its access to the sea, and this is a country whose basic business model was the export of food and fertilizer to the world for a lot of its, uh, for a lot of its business and eco economic growth. And it's a country that is financially insolvent. Simply to keep the lights on in the Ukrainian government, it's getting budget support from the US and the EU in the neighborhood of $3 billion a month, not a year, a month, 100 million a day. And that doesn't touch the reconstruction costs which are in the hundreds of billions, and that was before the destruction of the Khakhovka Dam and much more. That's the bad news. In other words, Russia, Putin looks at this and says, why do I need to stop the war? My enemy is uh, entering a period where eventually it will, its social society and economy may disintegrate. The good news is, one, a, the Ukrainian people in the crucible of this war are emerging stronger than they were before the war. A generation of Ukrainians, like Oleksandra actually, are coming into the foreground and are determined to build a new society after the victory, as they say. Two, Europe and the world has united behind Ukraine in a really heartening and gratifying way, in a lot of different ways. In other words, a lot of people are convinced by Alexandra's argument and are looking for a way to demonstrate accountability now. And third, in a unique circumstance in the history of the world, the aggressor state left the means to help its victims in the jurisdiction of law-abiding states. Russia left more than $300 billion in dollars and euros in bank accounts inside law-abiding states, which has now been frozen by those states and is sitting idle waiting to see if it can be mobilized to help Ukraine. In other words, the willpower, the people, and the means are at hand to launch what Bob Zellick and Larry Summers and I have called the other counteroffensive, a European recovery program that offers hope to Ukraine, to the region, to the future of the European Union, and to a sense of justice and accountability if we can mobilize this as we move from the stage of sanctions to the stage of countermeasures and launch the other counteroffensive. So, Phil, I do want to ask you, though, about uh, the other scenario, which is that Vladimir Putin uh, will be able to wait out the resolve of the United States uh, and other countries. And looking ahead to our election, I'm wondering uh, what you think is possible to do uh, in order to uh, uh, trump proof. Uh, the U.S. commitment to Ukraine. It's not a forever commitment if we can change our policy in, in 18 months. I think actually if the United States, Europe, and the world successfully launch these other counteroffensives, and those are up and running by next year, it will be impossible for any American president to then try to undo them. A huge forces will be put in motion that are clearly helping an embattled democracy, and I don't think any American president will then want to uh, um, turn the ignition off on that car. Alexandra, you mentioned your work as a human rights lawyer, and, and actually Andre mentioned you know, some of the atrocities that, that Russia has committed against civilians in Ukraine in the course of the war. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, number one, whether you think it's possible to pursue accountability for Russia while the fighting is still going on, uh, and then Number two, what, you know, what you've learned about the Russian way of war, uh, which seems very much directed uh, right at Ukraine's civilian population. That seems to be a core part of their entire strategy for this conflict. Russia uses war crimes as a method of warfare. Russia deliberately provides enormous pain and suffering to civilians 
in order to break people's resistance and occupy Ukraine. And all this hell which we now face in Ukraine, it's a result of total impunity which Russia enjoyed for decades. Because Russian troops commit horrible war crimes in Chechnya, in Moldova, in Georgia, in Mali, in Syria, in Libya, in other countries of the world. And they have never been punished. Russians believe they can do whatever they wanted. That is why we must break the circle of impunity, not just for Ukrainians, but to prevent possible Russian attack to other nations and other countries. And in order to do it, we have to change our way of thinking. Because when I speak with top officials of different countries, I see how they still look into the world through the prisma of Nuremberg trials, which was a central step to establish law and justice in the past century. But I will remind you that Nuremberg trials were tried Nazi war criminals after Nazi regime had collapsed. But we live in a new century. We must move further. Justice must be independent of the magnitude of Putin's regime's power. We cannot wait. We must establish special tribunal on aggression now and hold Putin, Lukashenko, and their surrounding accountable. So, Colin, uh, many of your colleagues have talked about the, the war in Ukraine as, you know, fundamentally, at least right now, uh, as a conflict that's focused on artillery and air defense, that those have been the most urgent and pressing needs for Ukraine. And, and, and that was the explanation that the Biden administration used for why it very reluctantly decided to uh, send the cluster munitions uh, to Ukraine, despite objections from many politicians here, despite uh, many European allies who've actually signed on to the international convention. I, I, I wonder if you can help us understand why it is that the U.S. did not have other ammunition available 16 months into the war. W what is it that is making it so hard uh, to ramp up our production, and when do you envision uh, that, that it might be able to supply both Ukraine's needs and also the United States' own needs? Yeah, it's a really important question, and actually one, a question that um, is front of mind for uh, uh, Secretary Austin, who's very focused on solving this problem. Look, the reality is that collectively over multiple administrations, uh, we have overinvested in platforms and underinvested in munitions. It's also the case that the Ukrainians are expending artillery munitions at a rate that our services would never uh, uh, intend to expend when you're expending, uh, you know, 90,000 rounds of 155 millimeter ammunition a month in steady state conditions. And when you go on the counteroffensive, that goes up two, three X. Uh, it's just not scenario, a scenario that we planned against and weren't resourced against. That's the bad news. Uh, the good news is that we've already doubled the domestic production of 155 millimeter ammunition. We will double and triple it again over the course of the next 12 to 18 months. We will be capable from the perspective of our defense industrial base to keep Ukraine in the artillery game for the foreseeable future if we build a bridge to that future. And that was fundamentally the, the decision on the DPICM issue, the cluster munitions. I'll also say, you know, cluster munitions are controversial. They are not all the same. Uh, we have an export uh, uh, ban on any munition with a dud rate of more than 1%. The cluster munitions we're sending have a dud rate of between 1.3 and 2.35%. Contrast that with the cluster munitions the Russians have been using with impunity against Ukrainian civilians with a dud rate of 30 or 40%. And even had we not provided these weapons, you know, for the next 30 or 40 years, Ukraine is going to have a demining issue because there's enormous not just the minefield scattered throughout the South, but the unexploded ordnance throughout the country. So we have to help Ukraine with that issue regardless. And frankly, the best way to help Ukrainian civilians is to, is to make sure that Ukraine is not defeated and that more Ukrainian territory is not taken so that the type of atrocities we've seen in the first 17 months of this phase of the war aren't repeated. So I, I want to ask you one more question quickly before I come back to Phil, and that is about Russia, because we spend a lot of time you know, talking about Ukraine, talking about NATO. I would like to know what has been the Pentagon's assessment of whether Putin has been weakened uh, by the recent events in Russia, and whether you've seen any evidence that that's made a difference on the ground in Ukraine, and, and also, 
why is it, you know, that Russia is attacking these civilian targets? Is that a militarily uh, valuable tool for them at this point? Are there other escalations? Uh, and I'm not talking about nuclear escalation. Are there other escalations that we could potentially be seeing in the coming months if Russia's efforts uh, do not bear better fruit with doing what they're doing right now? You know, you'd have to ask Vladimir Putin why he's uh, attacking Ukraine civilians directly. I think if it's an effort to terrorize and coerce, it's demonstrably failed, and it will continue to fail. It's brought Ukraine uh, and the Ukrainian people closer together. Um, uh, and I think to, it has a whiff of desperation to it. I do think it speaks to Phil's point, which is part of it is to put a strain on the Ukrainian economy and infrastructure in a way that creates a lasting burden on Ukraine and the West, but I will defer to Phil on that. I would say two things from the Pentagon's perspective. First, um, regardless of how the counteroffensive goes, um, Russia has already lost the war strategically. Uh, every ambition Putin had going into the war uh, has fallen flat and cannot be resuscitated. Uh, he wanted to conquer the entire country and wipe a sovereign, democratic, and independent Ukraine off the map. That didn't happen. It's not going to happen. He wanted to demonstrate that he was a, a global power in a multipolar world. His military has been shattered. Uh, by the war uh, in Ukraine and are less capable of threatening the rest of Europe and the world uh, as a consequence. And he wanted to divide the West and NATO, and the exact opposite has happened. Finland's now in the alliance. Sweden will soon uh, be in the alliance. Defense spending is going up uh, across uh, NATO. The defense industrial base is being uh, rejuvenated. So across the board, this has been a strategic loss. The last point. I, I, I agreed very much with Phil's uh, uh, portrayal of the good news, bad news. I'll add one other, which is, I'm not sure, Putin, I think Putin's theory of victory is that he'll outlast us all. He'll outlast the Ukrainians, the Americans, uh, the West. I don't think the long game looks great for Putin right now. Uh, he is not in a good position domestically for, an, for a mass mobilization. I think that would be incredibly fraught given the events of Prigozhin. He can't trust his military because the military did not lift a finger in the face of Prigozhin's mutiny, they let him, they let him waltz in and take the Southern Military uh, District uh, headquarters and then they let him you know, get two thirds of the way of a thunder run uh, to the Kremlin uh, without being attacked by a single Russian military uh, unit. Um, I wouldn't trust my military uh, in, in their circumstance. And oh, by the way, after Prigozhin did all of that, he was essentially let off uh, uh, scot-free. So I'm not sure if I'm Vladimir Putin, I think, you know what would be great? Let's do five or 10 more years of this. Uh, so, I, and his defense industrial base is also in bad shape and all his assets are locked up and the export controls are making it harder for him to reconstitute. So we have real leverage over him too whenever this comes to the end game. Phil, I'm gonna ask you a simple question. Uh, it's the question that uh, David Petraeus asked uh, in the beginning days of the war in Iraq. How does this end? That's a great question. Um, no, but the way to envision how this ends is um, don't think so much about the tactics of war termination. Um, imagine the post-war future. Imagine what do you want Europe and the world to be like two or three years from now. Uh, that's partly why I emphasize the, the economic point so much, and the whole idea of European revitalization along with Ukrainian revitalization. There's a level at which you know, the Korean War was fought to a draw on a ceasefire line, but uh, South Korea had, but South Korea was then beginning what would become a historic economic revival. The political and economic health of South Korea is what ultimately guaranteed its future and its safety and actually changing the whole nature of East Asia. You can repeat this illustration. So you have to envision what's the post-war world we want to envision? then what are the things we need to do then to start advancing that vision and get there? And get there in a way in which whatever Vladimir Putin wants to do or decides to do, Ukraine's going to be on the upward path. Ukraine is going to have a promising future in Europe, and that future is going to be the living rebuke to what Putin is doing in neighboring Russia. Alexandra, of course, I'm going to give you the last word, and I want to know from you, not only what you think about how this might end, but what is it that we here do not understand, you know, that is so clear to you from your vantage point in Kyiv? When large-scale invasion started, the democratic countries told, let's help Ukraine not to fail. And Ukraine obtained the first weapons to be able to defend ourselves, and first serious sanctions against Russia were introduced into force. 
and we are extremely grateful. Ukrainians will always remember all democratic countries who are with us in this very dramatic part of our history. But it's time to change this narrative to another one. Let's help Ukraine to win fast. There is a huge difference between let's help Ukraine not to fail and let's help Ukraine to win fast. These differences can be measured in types of weapons, speed of, of decisions, gravity of sanctions. The problem is that we have no time. The time for us converted in numerous deaths in battlefield, numerous deaths in occupied territories, numerous deaths in deep rear. And one more important point. When we say that Ukraine has to win, it means that Russia has to lose. And the problem is that democratic countries still have no vision what they will do in this situation. And this is, in my opinion, is a main barrier to change this narrative to help Ukraine to win fast, to set a common goal, because when we have a common goal, we have common strategy, and we'll find common resources how to fulfill this strategy. And there were no necessity for my friend, Andriana Susak, who left her six-year-old son and joined Ukraine armed forces to fight for her son's peaceful future. She will never blown up in a mine in civilian car when so much democratic countries have armed vehicles in their storages. So I know that nobody from democratic countries wants Russia to win because it will be a catastrophe. It's resulted a deep decrease of level of freedom in our world, which is so interconnected that only spread of freedom make our world safer. But why are we afraid of Russia will lose? Why, like, we see the problem, more problematic post-war period than ongoing war? Russia will lose. It's inevitable. The Soviet Union collapsed regardless whether or not we were ready for its collapse. It happened. And Russia will lose because Putin tries to return to the past future place against Putin. It's better to elaborate the common vision and be prepared for this future. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Alexandra, I can't think of a, a more important note to end on. And maybe Anya will have us back and a new group to discuss uh, the implications of Russia losing. How about that? Thank you, everyone.